If your time to you is worth saving, then you better start swimming or you'll sink like a stone. For the times they are changing. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Anson and Paul's Big Movie Podcast. I'm Anson Chan. And I'm Paul Morgan. And today we are watching or reviewing The Watchmen. And The Millennium Actress. Yes. Paul, which movie would you like to start with? I think we should start with The Millennium Actress. Ooh, curveball. Okay. Do you want to do the synopsis or should I? Uh, I'll give it a try. Sure. So a TV guy and his uh, loyal cameraman uh, go to meet a former actress and interview her about her career. And over the course of them interviewing her, we bounce back and forth in a kind of uh, crazy manner between the past, the present, and the actress's movies that she's done. And in each of these uh, settings, by some storytelling mumbo-jumbo, the TV interviewer and his cameraman end up with her kind of symbolically through most of her life. Yes. There's some other stuff that happens that revolves around uh, one of them actually being there for parts of her life, but that will, you know, we may or may not get into that later. So would you say that was an accurate (laughs) uh, synopsis? Yeah, I think that was a fair synopsis, a good and accurate one. Yeah. Uh, So Anson, what, uh, what worked for you in this flick? This movie, oh man, it's just so emotional. The way they tell the story is so interesting. I've never seen any other movie tell a story like the Millennium Actress does, where it blends... And can I assert that uh, this is the only venue in which this story would fit? I would not want to see a live-action version of this movie. I... Like, anime is the perfect way to do it. Yeah, I can't really imagine how you could do this in uh, live-action be really really yeah. fucking hard the cuts oh, yeah. would be too jarring yeah yeah there'd be a lot of use of cgi and that would look like shit yeah yeah so the way they're able to kind of uh tell the story which blends her real life story with the narrative of the movies that she was in with you know the director and the camera guy interacting in this world like they're in a way breaking the fourth wall without fully breaking the fourth wall they see the crazy flashback things that are happening and filming crazy flashback things that are happening as they're happening and acknowledging how some things are weird, right? Like, when did we get yeah. into feudal Japan? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> things like that for, like, comic and dramatic effect. But they don't go so far as to address the audience, which, yeah, thank God, I love that. I hate when it breaks the wall too hard and, like, it gives you a wink <laughs> yeah. and a nod. This one doesn't do that. It's... It toes this really weird line just before breaking, right? Although it breaks its own line of them making the movie, which is another really interesting thing that they're able to accomplish, which is, again, kind of highlighting where real life meets movies or when movies become real life or you know, yeah. how people experience movies in their life, which can be real or sure. you know, fantasy or however they find themselves in that moment or whatever. It's, it's, it's a beautiful exercise in immersion and just completely unique storytelling. I've never, again, I've never seen anything like it. That alone yeah. merits so much praise. For that, I would just recommend this movie oh so highly, just to see, like, look at what this medium can do. Movies and animation, you know, it's just everything. This is just such a beyond a visionary movie, in my opinion. It's just so genius. I like its setting. I like how it takes place in the early days of Japanese movie making. So there's a lot of yeah. um, references to both pre and post World War uh, Japan, which is like very ingrained in Japanese culture. You know, the the ancient stuff, the what we would consider like cowboys and Indians. They have samurais and feudal kind of like lord struggles, and so they have a lot of yeah. that imagery and cool stuff going on, as well as a uh, You know, even some modern stuff of, like, today's anime or even just, like, interest, which is, like, space and exploration. And they have some, a little bit of there, here and there, a little bit of flair. Yeah. It just does things so effortlessly and seamlessly when it takes you from period to period. And, by the way, that's just, like, a very Japanese thing. Um, 
in the very beginning, like opening shots when they're kind of going through Japan and they're like hitting the countryside, just seeing like the very modern Japan with its Shinkansens, it's like, you know, lightning fast rails, it's like buildings and like everything's all electric. They also see the very old life of like the temples and the houses and the forest, the gardens, people in kimonos. You see people in suits next to people in kimonos in Japan. Like that never went out of style in a lot of places, right? So you see that world of contrast in their culture and in this movie, and they do it to like a very beautiful, for like symbolic imagery's sake, I guess you'd say. Yeah. And I think that was just very powerful. The story, the romance, the nostalgia you get from this movie is so palpable. I choked up a couple times just watching this movie. I don't know why. I think seeing a lot of war imagery for me is like a trigger for some reason. Also seeing like the simpler time and like sometimes the... uh, the innocence of youth kind of stuff sometimes will get me choked yeah. up. And this movie had it all. And there were definite moments where I'm like, oh, man. Like, <laughs> it just gets, like, so sad or uh, very touching to me. And uh, yeah. I think it's just so beautiful. God, this movie is fucking powerful. By the time you're done with the movie, for me personally, I felt a little drained. It was like... Oh, yeah, certainly. I needed yeah. that release or that to be done with the movie because of just how like excited or worked up I was getting in the movie, right? That I needed to step away from it and breathe. Yeah. I wanted to watch this a second time. Uh, spoiler alert, I didn't. Because it was hard for me to bring myself back to have another, you know, like emotional roller coaster slash I wanted it to be the roller coaster and I was scared it wouldn't be the second time. You know, so shortly yeah. after. Also... I didn't want to jump into that again and just get so emotionally drained again from watching this movie. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. it feels like the perfect one and done, but this is definitely a movie that merits study and further um, further viewing. So I feel like I really should have watched this again. I wanted to watch this again, but I wanted I to watch it again too, to. but I was just like, I don't want to undergo that. Yeah. Of yeah. Emotional uh, the, turmoil there. The first impression I got from it, well, I've seen this before, but years ago. But coming back to it again, the first impression I got was just so strong. I wanted to keep that first impression as my whole impression. It was just so yeah. powerful. I like that feeling. I like when the movie can do that, where yeah, you want it framed, <laughs> almost. You want that experience framed. You don't want it to be taken away. I really enjoy the mystery of this movie. It's revealed quickly, and you didn't mention your synopsis, but there's a mystery regarding a key in this movie. Yeah. And the way that that continually plays a really important part in this lady's life and uh, later kind of like, you know, everyone around her's life because it's so important to her. Yeah. It's just... Every crew member on her movie. The director and this jealous actress. She has a relationship yeah. with an actress who, when she first starts out, she's kind of like, she knows she's going to be the new face. She's younger. Um, yeah. And so she's jealous and worried about her career compared to hers which is interesting it's, uh, and it's never quite yeah. explicitly well it is said actually she does come out with a moment saying like she literally says I was jealous of your youth she yells that at her <laughs> yeah and you would have gotten that without uh, her saying it because of yes exactly you could you could tell exactly what's going on from the yeah. first question that Chiyoko asks you're like oh I know what's what this is coming to but then she flat out just goes and says it, which I think when they is have like a reveal, yeah, the uh, yeah, the way they're able to like frame that real life moment too on the set was so interesting. Like, oh man, yeah, I thought I thought that was real at first. I thought I th- still the- kind of do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like that's kind of real, but you know, then they cut out to the director, and you're like, whoa, what the fuck? It did that so effectively, so many times. Because <laughs> you don't know where the story starts and the movie yeah. starts or ends or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Like, this is so interpretive, this movie. It's just so yeah. fucking beautiful. And it doesn't done it in like a, they did a bad job telling the story way or they did a bad job writing it way. Because it's done so quick and it's done so effectively that it's actually just done an excellent effect. Yeah. It just keeps you wondering. This, to me, is very much like the prestige where there's so many magic Ooh, tricks okay. involved, where like you kind of want to yes. watch it again to see the magic tricks, but yeah. this is actually so much more impactful than the Prestige was. That, like I said, I wanted to hold this there and keep it framed like 
if you would, that canister of film on the shelf. Or, you know what I mean? Sure, sure. Just yeah. the perfect edit, leave it as fine. This, this is the director's cut, kind of in my mind. But yeah. if I were to go back and try to study it and dissect it, there'd be something there for me too. And I will one of these days have to bring myself to do it, but it's hard for me to... It's like when you get a really nice plate of food. Say you get like a really cute dessert, and it's like a little bear face or something. So once upon a time I was growing up, we had things called koala cookies. They're filled with chocolate. But on the faces, they're little koalas, right? They're really, really, really cute. Okay. I could send you a picture now. Hold on. Just for the sake of, for laughs. Yeah. Koala cookies. So they're little Japanese cookies. And uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Here is a good picture. And so as a kid, I was always like, oh. Oh, yes. I've, I've eaten these before. Yeah. They're too cute for me to eat. I'm like, oh, they're so cute. I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to break these. And like, I don't yeah. want to, but they're going to get stale. I opened them. And then, like, eventually I'd have to bring myself to, like, all right, here I go. And I'd always bite off the head first. I'd always bite off the head so I wouldn't look as cute anymore. <laughs> End never... its pain. End yeah. its pain. <laughs> the first few I always bite off the heads until I can start, like, just eating the whole thing. And, like, yeah. this movie is, like, that really cute koala cookie. But <laughs> to a much, much stronger degree. It's like, I don't want to bite into this. It's so pretty on its surface. And by its surface, I mean on its first encounter. Yeah. Again, I just want to bring up the way that Satoshi Kon plays with time and dreams. Yeah. His themes of living, I guess what is perceived as life for him, is just so yeah. fucking strong. I've never seen any other director really capture that mood or that feeling. I must chide you now for watching Paprika in English again, because so much of it is lost in the English translation. Wait, I didn't watch Paprika in English I watched uh, Akira in English. I still Ooh. haven't seen Paprika. Okay, never mind. I have to take it all back then. I recently yeah. watched... When I watch Paprika, it will be in Japanese. Okay, yeah. They say that's a seminal, like his boom contribution as his like life work movie. Sure, sure. To the art form or to the Japanese film. But, God, I think Millennium Actress is so overshadowed by Paprika. It's really... It might be better in what it does but paprika was more groundbreaking in what it accomplished at the time and okay anyway going back to satoshi khan the way that he's able to connect with the audience on like such a fanciful and nostalgic level is amazing it's just unbelievable yeah let me tell you a little bit about satoshi khan satoshi khan died a while ago and he was young he was very young and he had a really bad form of cancer that i think was un- incurable and he didn't tell anybody, like, nobody. Oh, fuck. <laughs> so a lot of his movies, I think, are laced with his feeling of, or his perception of time, or his experience of life. Paprika, for sure. I see this one definitely has a lot of that, too. I'm not sure if he had cancer at the time of making this one. But, yeah, so Satoshi Kon died rather way too young. He was in the middle of making one more movie. And then he died, which is just a huge fucking shame. Um, yeah. Because it never got finished. And uh, yeah, just that feeling that you get from watching his movies specifically are just so powerful. Because I think he he did live a life knowing that, like, you know, it was all ending soon. And not in like, a, you know, this is the end of my point in my life. Like, I moved to New York. Here's the end of my Washington life. I feel very, you know say goodbye to Washington kind of thing. No, this is like actual real life. I'm saying goodbye to actual life. Yeah, yeah. You get those feelings of experiencing the past or a bleak future or like a hopeful future or whatever. Like you get those feelings so strongly from Satoshi Kon's movie that yeah. movies that shit. He still is my favorite Japanese director that I know of because of what he's able to do and the emotions he's able to elicit as well as the themes that he's able to tackle. And he does it in such a creative way. Like, truly, man, fucking love this guy. I don't know where else I'm going to go with the Millennium Actress. I'm sure there's a lot I'm missing out on. Oh, I really like the director. I love the characters. The characters are so strong. I like the director who's directing oh, yeah. the um the documentary of Chiyoko, the actress. Yeah. He's just such a fun character. He's such a lovable character. And you can empathize with him and so much. And a lot of times he's the comic relief that reminds you, hey, we're not actually in peril because this is a movie. Yeah, or like, 
when it cuts back to him in real life, it's like he's just wearing a samurai helmet or something, doing a scene with her. And for him, he's <laughs> yeah. like living out his life's dream to be yeah. able to recite some lines and be part of these his like favorite scenes with the actress who he's just totally adored his whole life. It's so funny. And you just yeah. you really get that feeling of like you can put yourself there instantly. Oh, it's yeah, so relatable. Dude. It's like meeting up with your favorite like music artist and being like Yo, so then you played this show that that was totally amazing. And then they'd be like, pick up the drums, getting mad at you about it. Yeah, they would want to play with you. Say, really? And you're gonna play the drums with them while they do that thing or something. It'd be fucking amazing. Dream come true. So you get that. It's hilarious, man. And there's more to this movie that I really cherish it for too. It's like I said, for me, I have like that weird history. I'm half Chinese, half Japanese. And so to see this movie kind of bring those two things together, of like, you know, hey, this is what you know imperial japan was like also this is you know we're going to manchuria but not all japanese didn't yeah you know weren't about this whole invade manchuria thing slash you know early days of filmmaking uh i recently went to california to see my uh, grandpa's funeral but he was involved in the uh hong kong film industry at its very early days and a lot of this stuff is just so this to me is like a movie fascinating on like literally every personal level. It's just so good. Yeah. Watching like the whole what it must have been like life kind of thing. I can kind of imagine my grandpa in a weird way on set. <laughs> or you know what I mean? Like in that life or fulfilling yeah. that role. The cultural aspect of like Japan I think is just very fascinating and endearing to me as well. And then personally the emotional, you know, tones it hits, the very oh my god, this movie is just a goddamn home run. I don't know what else there is to say. And if I just babble on for an hour more, I'm sure I could, but I don't want to do that. Paul. Yeah. What in the Millennium Actress worked for you? Well, I'm probably going to be repeating a lot of things that you said. I think first off, the interviewer guy was just delightful. Mm. I don't want to give too much away because I want to probably encourage people to watch this, but um, yeah, there's like a scene in which you find out that he uh, was pretty intricately involved in the in Shioko's life previously. Uh, I won't really say how or anything, but uh, that scene I thought was just uh, a real delight because in a way, like at first you're seeing just scenes from her memory and just scenes from her movies. And it's kind of all from her perspective. And that guy kind of comes in and he's just experiencing it for the first time. Mm-hmm. But then there are other memories after that where, like, you know that he's been in her life where he's even there at times, and it'll totally shift the perspective of any of the flashbacks Yeah, um, to be a, a little bit more well-rounded. And I thought that was kind of fun how, like, it was kind of like if you expand your perspective outward, then scenes have ten times the amount of meanings that they had if you just have one perspective in a scene. And I think it's kind of that's kind of almost a little bit of a metaphor for the way life is. Is like if mm-hmm. you feel empathy towards people and you kind of expand your perspective outwards to include their perspectives, or you try to understand their points of view, mm-hmm. uh, life has a lot more uh, kind of interesting possibilities, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, so I thought that was really really well done. I felt very strongly tied to that. Um, Can we talk about that really, really quick, really, like off the air? Yeah, I'll probably cut this part out. That moment okay. where he. He looks back at his younger self looking back at something else. Yeah. Because there's both moments where present Genya chases Chiyoko, and so does past Genya. But then only present Genya really stops to look back at him looking back at the, yeah. at the police guy on the ground. And that was such a powerful, yeah, chill-inducing like moment where you just see the whole story kind of shift gear. You say, oh, shit, yeah. there's someone else's life here, too. And not just the director's yeah. life, but also the police. You know, there's that big moment of empathy because he feels so yeah, so strongly to the police guy. He's like, what happened? You know, like, he feels the need to comfort him, right? Yeah. And then is is revealed, you know, the, the fucking... And yet, he allowed that secret to be kept to... I don't know why, but maybe, you know, so that Chiyoko could still chase that dream. She, he maybe didn't want to crush her, you know, uh... Yeah, because you can see that that uh, it drives her dream is such a uh, kind of a, a deep one for her. It's like it's really the, really changed her weirdly. 
yeah, it's has brought her all these things, and at the same time, it it has tormented her in the same process. And also, process. I think the old la- the older actress who like says she was jealous of her, she literally says how like chasing this dude who you would never find kept, her kept young. you young. Yeah, so it's like that's kind of an interesting way of going with that as well. Sorry, we were just talking about Genya's changing role. Yeah. I don't know. It's funny how you don't think of a concept like that as being super easily expressed in a uh, film format. No. Uh, Especially without someone, some like (laughs) religious teacher, like preaching it or something. Yeah. Yeah, It's just done with like such a effortless slide from. Yeah. Done with very, uh, with a lot of care. Another part that really uh, kind of sat, I mean, this is something we've discussed before, but this always like really freaks me the fuck out is war related stuff. Uh, Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if this was a memory or a movie, but the the firebombing of Tokyo part. Oh yeah. That I I assume that was supposed to be the firebombing of Tokyo during World War II. Oh, it looked like it. Yeah. That was, ah, that really sat with me. Yeah, that triggers me. I, I get choked up saying shit like that. <laughs> yeah, because it's like, you know, I believe more people died during the firebombing of Tokyo than um, in the uh, explosion of the first atomic bomb. That's true. I think it was like 100,000 people during that bombing raid. And you see any sort of personal zoomed in story within the context of that happening around you it's going to increase its power uh, very greatly, I think. Oh, man. It's just fucking horrifying to see. Yeah. Uh, and just very well done for horrifying effects specifically. I really also thought that the seamless transition between flashback and movie or movie and flashback or movie and movie were like so inventively done and mm-hmm. had such good transition dialogue and visuals to go with it and stuff. I felt like, I was like, what am I, what am I watching? It was, it was like a totally unique experience, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. It's uh, unlike anything else. Yeah, definitely. I, I don't have a lot of specifics other than those couple of what I liked. Um, but, you know, I think just this whole movie is just a really, really interesting flick. Was there anything that didn't work for you or that you like think could have been changed? God. Uh, my immediate answer is no. I think the music is a little bit weird. It's a little kitschy. It's really electronic and loud. When it's okay. like, it doesn't really fit the theme so much. Sure. When it you was watch, very early 2000s, that's for sure. Yeah, when you watch Paprika... That type of music fits Paprika much more because it okay. is a little bit weirder and the electronics are like a little bit weirder. It didn't sure. feel wholly right. If this is an evolution to Paprika, then yeah, it's perfect. This is a necessary step that it needed to take in the evolutionary cycle. Yeah. But for this movie, I think the music might have done better with... Elliot I don't even Smith. Know, maybe not even like orchestrated. I don't even know. You know what I mean? Like, I'd, Yeah. It didn't take me out, but I noticed it too much. And it didn't. Sure. It didn't slide into the scene very well. It didn't. It did its job, but it wasn't good. The fact that I noticed it is is a problem, and it wasn't noticed in a good way. That's the only thing I can think of. What about you, Paul? Was there anything that didn't work for you, or something that you could? Um, have, uh, the only changed? thing I will say. I mean, I understand your point with the music. I, I didn't really get affected by that. So the only thing, as a result, that I will say didn't really work for me is. Even though it kept a lot of the movie going and even though it kind of helped a lot of the characters to have a lot of uh, very important scenes, there is something in my gut that bothers me when I see men or women. So let's say the camera guy and Chiyoko, or sorry, the interviewer and Chiyoko. I do not like when people chase a lost love that is like so obviously Pikachu. so let's start with the baseline there the interviewer guy is sort of doing that in Chiyoko yeah I don't like the idea of chasing a lost love because without getting into what results from that there are points in the story where it's like 
dude, just give up and move on. Oh, <laughs> I know that sounds harsh, but it's like, even as a trope, it bothers you as a trope. It bothers me because I feel like in, mm. and God help me. I'm not going to be able to list any good examples right now, but in specifically movie fiction, I don't like that as a trope and it seems like it happens a lot. But other than that, the, the thing is, is that I say that, but I also, if that wasn't in the movie, completely different movie. So like I said, I don't enjoy that trope whatsoever, but it works fine in this movie. It just bothered me that it was in there. Other than that, I don't have any negative things really to say about this. That was uh, like one of the most inventive movies I've ever seen. Uh, yeah. and like yeah. total, total quality was very, very high. Well then, Paul, would you recommend the Millennium Actress? Uh, yeah, I would definitely recommend it. Uh, I think probably to everyone. What about you? Would you recommend this movie? This movie has my 100% seal of approval. Nice. I would also recommend this to everyone. I don't care if they don't like it. I feel like it is some reason, like, I have to just give this wholeheartedly at my seal of, go, you must watch this. It's a must yeah. watch. Uh, on the other hand, though, now that I'm thinking about it, I definitely would not recommend it to people who have to, like, talk and ask questions the whole movie long, because it's like a full sensory experience if you really uh, kind of immerse yourself in it. I, I wouldn't want to be stopping every every few minutes just to answer someone's uh, silly little Well, that's the beautiful thing, Paul. We don't have question. to. We're, uh... Well, I live on my own, so I could give this a blanket recommendation and not have to worry sure, about someone sure, asking sure. me questions. But if you're talking about like your mom or something, uh, <laughs> that's on you and your mom. <laughs> no, I don't know. I I see a lot of movies. Oh, most of them are alone, but you know, you end up seeing them with people, and some people you realize are not great theater companions. That's all I'm saying. Oh, yo, oh, okay, I know what you mean. Like, I don't know if I would like, you know watch this with a group of friends or a date or something. Yeah, certainly not. Man, yeah, this is a movie I want to watch alone. Because <laughs> yes, this is a movie, sure. like, I want to super-duper indulge and let myself get choked up without worrying about, like, oh, sorry, I'm, you know, I should not be this worked up over this movie or this scene. Yeah. But I am for some reason. Yeah. Still, though, I would still blanket recommend this. God, what Perfecto. a weird caveat. What a weird caveat. But that's so true. There'd be a lot of questions yeah. to be asked. You had one of those persons like, we were. Yeah. Yeah. Not fun. <laughs> they ruin every movie, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> Human beings ruin every movie. Yeah. Uh, okay, so our next movie, uh, Anson, do you want to tell us about uh, The Watchmen? Yes. Hello, Hello darkness, darkness, my old friend. I've come to watch The Watchmen again. The 2009 movie, directed by Zack Snyder, written by David Hayter and Alex Tz, and one other guy. The original maker of the comic, I forget his name. Alan Moore. There you go. The original graphic novel by Alan Moore is about the Watchmen, a group of quote-unquote superheroes tasked with fighting crime and later preserving world peace in a Soviet-era post-Vietnam war. The movie takes place after the Watchmen kind of Congress Act has been passed where masks are no longer allowed. Uh, many of them are out of, in retirement, out in the open, living different various careers based on their past experience as Watchmen, as well as the government and society's interaction with them as heroes, both publicly and privately. The movie begins with the death of the comedian, one of the Watchmen from the very beginning, thrown out of his apartment to the beautiful sounds of Unforgettable by Nat King Cole. And the early half, I think, of the movie focuses a lot on the life and the mystery that was the comedian, both in terms of his death, but in terms of his personality and what he stood for. Later, the focus shifts to this overall conspiracy of what is happening in regards to the Watchmen and with the Watchmen as uncovered by Rorschach. I think one of our more main characters, would you say? Yeah. Rorschach, the kind of like noir-esque detective hard-nosed character, as he uncovers a nefarious plot involving the Watchmen and uh, everyone else as, you know, as a whole, and how that deals with the climate, the sociopolitical climate at the time. How's that? Yeah, I think that's uh, accurate and uh, adequate. 
There you go. Well, Mr. Mulgan, what did you like? What worked for you in The Watchmen? So I, I hope this doesn't go too long, but I'm going to try and make this concise. Take as much time as you want. The consistently kind of apocalyptic tone that it feels like much of this movie has. I believe that kind of starts with the colors and then bleeds into the sort of slow moving, constantly slow motion camera to the constant dialogue about old times and how things seemed very bleak in the world to the kind of nihilistic omniscience of Dr. Manhattan. Uh, the tone of apocalypse impending is uh feels very strong to me and i'm very drawn to that because it's a feeling that i have in my personal life that i don't see translated very well to cinema a lot of the time blade runner 2049 did an excellent job of creating a very similar tone to that i really love that there are not really any name brand actors in this movie Mm mm-hmm I mean, they are name brand now, but I don't think they were all name brand at the time outside of the the woman who played the, the owl. Who played the who? The owl. No, no, no. The not, woman who uh, played Malin the owl? Mullen Acker- Ackerman, sorry. Uh, Billy Crudup, I mean, he's been in some stuff, and people are starting to know Jackie Earl, Earl Haley, Jeffrey Dean Morgan, and Patrick Wilson a little bit better. But at the time that this movie was made, none of them were like super big household names, I would say, Mm -hmm. uh, save for Billy Crudup. The acting is all really good because it feels like they are just people in a real world who had a job and now that job's over. It's it's like they're almost like old war buddies or something like that. It's like they're very good at acting nostalgically for the past in um, Patrick Wilson and Mullen Ackerman's case, or, uh, you know, kind of, I don't want to say, maybe like apoplectic in the case of Rorschach. I just had to look that word up to make sure it was the word I was looking for. Uh, How about you or uh, define like, that uh, for your boy Anson and those at home who don't know what that just means? Just like boiling over with like anger and indignance at how the world is. Good word. That's how I would describe <laughs> Rorschach. I don't know. I feel like the acting was so good. Uh, everyone did a serviceable job, especially the guy who voiced Dr. Manhattan, like that kind of dead droning was like so beautiful and it makes so much of his uh, dialogue so much more impactful. I think the, the reasonableness, the reasonability, (laughs) the reasonableness of the supervillain actually being smarter than everyone and things going right for him. And you know, like, because I feel like, it's a common thing like supervillains are just super misguided people who do, who think they're doing the right thing a lot of the time because they, their intentions might be selfish or whatever else. This guy is a supervillain who is smarter than everyone else has more resources than everyone else. And he is like essentially the better quality answer to all those inept ones from superhero stories past. Like, has this movie been out long enough that we're not spoiling it? Can we? Can I spoil it? I would like to talk about this and spoil it because it'll make it so much easier to talk about. But if you okay, feel that so we shouldn't, he, then we can dodge. The super villain in this movie succeeds, and five seconds before he succeeds, he says, do you really think that I would explain my master stroke to you if there was any possibility that you would be able to stop it? No. Yeah. No. That's reason. I like that. I like that reasonableness. Yeah. It's like, please, and I like that I he wins because his win is like the greatest win of all time for supervillains. It's like, look, I made the world a better place by being a horrific, awful person. And, you know, because of me, maybe our civilization you killed millions to save billions. Yeah, exactly. Like, come on, man. If that isn't the most, like, uh, pessimist but solid logic thing I've ever heard. It's like, man, he really, he did all the math on this one. So I like that the super villains like really smart and also does what he intends to do and then like succeeds. And yeah, that might spell the end for some of these, uh, superheroes, but I think that's an incredibly smart plot device. Obviously you credit Alan Moore with that, not necessarily the filmmakers, but yeah, like it's Alan Moore, just really excellent 
work in that regard. Um, I want to talk about two of my favorite characters real quick before I si- send it over to you. I think Dr. Manhattan and Rorschach represent to me two of the most interesting perspectives in this movie. Absolutely. So Dr. Manhattan is like this, what's that? Absolutely. A hundred percent agree. Uh, Dr. Manhattan is like this, uh, you know, guy got turned into what is essentially like a God, um, like a, a literal controller of the physical world of physics. Yeah. Uh, he's kind of turned into this nihilistic, like, listen, dude, nothing really matters. Um, it's all kind of uh, bullshit, and you guys are kind of wasting your time doing he's all this stuff. He's a fatalist, stuff. but at the same time, yeah. he says we have to try. He will wholly admit, like, there's no point. <laughs> it's like... Yeah, exactly. He's like, I yeah. have to do this because I chose to do this, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, My responses really like- are presupposed, or like preordained, but I still yeah. have to feel them and like, have them in that moment. Yeah. So, do you want to explain a little bit about why he feels that way? Um, well, I think he's kind of disconnecting from humanity. They, uh, I mean, the idea is for him to be disconnecting from humanity. Well, he's- also... Okay, I think specifically he experiences all of time at once. Yeah. The past, the present, and the future. He's like, uh, what's that one movie about the aliens that came here to learn their language? Uh, Arrival? He's like an arrival alien. He can just like pull from any moment in time that he experiences and yeah. like no shit from it. And then like a weird chicken or the egg way, he just... It's a fully encompassed circle. What he'll know in the future, he can know in the past, but it still has to affect the past for it to affect the future, if you will. Yeah. It's like this weird fucking what kind of philosophy. Anyway, sorry, I cut you off. No, I I just think that character is really interesting because of his his essentialism about the universe. It's like, well, I mm-hmm. I know physics because I am the embodiment of like controlling physics in the space around me. In essence, I have control over certain aspects of time as well. It's like he knows all of this and because he knows all of that, he is resigned and unfeeling and uncaring but also still holding on to some of his human care for others i don't know really interesting kind of character and then rorschach on the other hand i really like that he's kind of like a classic detective with a bone to pick yeah but just like he's magnified yeah he's such a round character and it all is like a makeup for his extreme like insecurity and anger issues. But he's also really fucking smart. He seems to be like the kind of person who we would talk about or the type of like a uh, fictional character you would talk about when you talk about like uh, Americans worshipped for the uh, for the damaged. He's like an anti-hero in the Punisher sort of way. Mm -hmm. For him, killing's not off the table, and there are lots of things that are just black and fucking white, Mm -hmm. and that's it. Yep. So, I I don't know. I feel like those two characters warrant a mention in terms of, like, the extreme high level of quality of this movie. Mm -hmm. But now uh, on to what worked for you. Oh! Sorry, I kind of rambled there for a sec. God, no. I was going to say, I'm sure there's so much more you could have gone into. Yeah. Well, now it's my turn to ramble. Uh, right. Love this first 10 minutes of this movie. Uh, it's so strong. I. Oh, yeah. That's like a short film in and by itself. The first 10 minutes is so beautifully put together. Yeah. The times there are changing at the end. Oh. Yeah. The death of the comedian is an amazing sequence, followed by, oh, the times, they are a change. And seeing, like, the pictures and, like, the moments where the Minutemen and the Watchmen are kind of, like, dealing with crime in society. Yeah. And, the again, the political climate, a.k.a. in Vietnam and all these other places. Uh, followed by Rorschach's quickly into the noir uh, voiceover monologue. October 1st, a comedian died tonight, you know. Yeah. Beautiful. Excellent. His whole internal monologue is just so beautiful and flowery. It's very, I don't know how to say it, it exudes brevity. It is breveditable. You know what I mean? It, it's just very... It's poetic uh, as well. Yes, yeah, poetic. Like, he'll oftentimes, like, drop a lot of unnecessary words, but the, you know, the point is completely gotten across, right? Yeah. And um, it's just so deliberate, his way of speaking, at the same time being so titillating in the use of his language and the description he 
can give to like the seedy underbelly of society kind of like talks. That's yeah. just so nice to hear. Also, my favorite characters were Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger. Just kidding. The Dr. Manhattan and Rorschach. They are amazing. I really oh, like dude. the voiceover that, or the voice of Dr. Manhattan. Oh, yeah. He drones a little bit, like you said. He's He kind of like doesn't really ever move out of an octave of his voice. But yeah. he says everything with like a really a very kind of like sad tone. Yeah. It's so nice to hear cuz he kind of trails off a little bit. He has that vocal fry and then he has yeah. that sad sound whenever he's recalling something or saying something. Everything sounds sad to him as one who might perceive the end of all things while at the same time the beginning of all things. You know what I mean? Yeah. Right. I am looking at the stars. They're so far away, and their light takes so long to reach us. All we ever see of stars are their old photographs. And that is so beautiful to see his like him grapple the very objective reality of certain things, of his kind of like Zen attitude. But at the same time, being depressed and hopeful. Like, oh man, his, his character is just so interesting. When people ask, like, if you could have one superpower, what would it be? And I'm saying, Dr. Manhattan. I always say, Dr. <laughs> Manhattan, that doesn't count. And I'm like, yes, it does. He's a superhero. <laughs> Fuck you. And because I could control everything, live forever, perceive time at all moments, <laughs> control the physical uh, reality as we know it. Like, right. that's a great power. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, you could witness yeah. events that were so tiny and so fast that they can hardly have been said to occur at all. Yep, you took the quote right out of my mouth. I was going to bring that up. <laughs> He's just... Oh, man. His lines and Rorschach's lines are by far the best in the movie. Dude, yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> to quote old Wally Weaver, his friend from his physics days or when he was alive, you see, at the time, I was misquoted. I, I, I see him like a Woody Allen, so I'm going to say it like a Woody Allen. <laughs> he was trying to be like a Woody He looked just like him. You see, at the time, I was misquoted. I never said the Superman exists and he's American. What I said was, God exists and he is American. <laughs> now, if you begin to feel an intense and crushing feeling of religious terror at the concept, don't be alarmed. That indicates only that you are still sane. And it's like, yeah. yay, Dr. <laughs> Man. <laughs> oh, I love his character. And um, the Rorschach, I just uh, love him so much. If I could dress up for Halloween as any two superheroes, it would be Rorschach and Dr. Manhattan. <laughs> Just totally interesting. I would love to go around talking like this. It's like Christian <laughs> it's like Bale talking ripped in a Batman off. voice. Yeah. Exactly. Christian Bale ripped off Rorschach. <laughs> yeah. If I had to say. But um, I don't know. I guess that's chicken. Um, that's not chicken or egg, but, you know. Where are the other drugs going? Where's the trigger? Where's Bane? This corrupt society, the CD underbelly of Gotham. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, you can kind of see where those two overlap. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I just love Rorschach's character so much. Um, I really like seeing what could it have been like if the superhero exists, the caped crusader turned into a Superman, or, or, or Superman existing in a real-life world, you know, yeah. World War II era to uh, Cold War era. I think that is such an interesting exploration. Yeah. The visual gags and parody is just so... You must mention. Oh, yeah. Nixon and Kissinger in the war room is taken <laughs> yeah. straight out of Dr. Strangelove. Yeah. It's set up exactly like that, the, from the lighting yeah. to the circular uh, table. Circular table. The big everything. screens and everything. Yeah. I thought that was really funny. I think yeah. the Nixon impersonator was hilariously cartoonish, which I love. Oh, yeah. Delightful. I love seeing old depictions of like Kissinger and um, uh, Nixon. They're just such yeah. a funny couple. And seeing, seeing Nixon with his big nose and him obviously doing an <laughs> yeah. impression of Nixon is just so funny to me. <laughs> like, I love that shit so much. It always makes me really happy. I also read the comics, by the way. Have you read the Watchmen comic? Uh, I have not read all of it, no. I would recommend. Um, this is probably... I haven't read a lot of comics, spoiler alert, but 
And people say like, oh, you know, it, it, it did do a good job of uh, sticking to the source material. Or when people like cry about that sort of stuff. Not specifically this movie. I will point out that yeah. this movie does it incredibly well. That is incredibly faithful to its source material. But a lot of people don't feel the same way. But well, I think a lot of people, a lot of the arguments I've seen for that being the case are people saying that like, well, there's some things in the comic that you just can't replicate on film, which is like, oh, certain big sections of the comic will have sections that match front to back. So like you start at the first yeah. page of this section and the last page of this section and go backwards and forwards at the same time. A lot of the frames match perfectly or ha- like supplement each they other play with each other. Yeah. Yeah. There's no way you could do that in a movie. I mean... Also, times what I hear is, like, nitpicks of, like, well, they totally left out this story arc. And it's like, yeah, that was necessary to the plot, though. Yeah, this is a two and a half hour movie. Yeah. And I know they left some shit out, but gosh, it as a movie, this is like a self-contained masterpiece. Masterpiece. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Thematically like, and character-wise, morally, the whole look and feel and the atmosphere spot yeah, on gosh. i can say after reading the comics uh it really captures all that if you're going to be picky about like comic design and um like i said missing a couple story arcs like it, really just a couple of them a few of them yeah uh, and honestly it, for every cares. comic book <laughs> what, oh sorry oh, no go please go please i'll i'll continue for, later. honestly like you said you haven't read a lot of comic books i have read a lot of comic books i you still read them all the fucking time as a kid. And for every mm-hmm. comic book that has an amazing adaptation like this one, there are a million comic books that have fucking horrible adaptations. Oh, yeah. For and real. That's not just counting, like, the few Marvel movies that turned out badly. That's like, have you seen Walking Dead lately? It's a primetime soap oh, opera. And that comic book was fucking amazing. Hmm. Every page of that comic book is this gorgeous comic masterpiece. And now on Sunday nights on AMC, you can watch primetime soap opera. It's <laughs> so disappointing. But anyways, that's why this deserves some extra credit for being a really good adaptation in terms of story and themes and characters. Yeah. And stuff. To quote our boy, Jodorowsky, uh, you got to rape it. Or, <laughs> oh, God. Okay. I got I'm cutting that for now. When you take a story, sometimes you gotta rape it for its best parts. You gotta (laughs) strip the land kind of thing. (laughs) And in this, I wouldn't even say he raped it for his best parts. He got almost everything, minus the unnecessary fat. I mean, I love quoting Jodorowsky saying that, because when he said that in the documentary, it was so shocking, but you have to realize (laughs) what he said is so true. Yeah. Every time I... He just maybe needs to work on his English. (laughs) No, 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 it's fine. It's perfect. (laughs) Maybe add a couple words to his vocabulary there. I think that whenever I edit the podcast and I'm, I'm feeling a little bit weird, like, well, we did say that, or, uh, nope, ripping it for its best part, and then I'll make an edit. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so I think that stuck with me, so I like to bring that up. Yeah. Spoiler alert, I'm not a rapist. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, so what else worked for you? I love the comedian as well. I forgot to mention the comedian is an excellent character, too, where he's a parody of society kind of thing. Yeah. Inserting him as like the guy who mercilessly flamethrowers the Viet Cong, shoots a pregnant Vietnamese lady, tries to walk away from her first, right? Like, fuck you, I don't need you. I'm not we're not talking about nothing, no kid. Yeah. I'm gone. I'm never gonna remember you or the shithole little backwater country. And then just guns a pregnant lady down kind of person, right? And just yeah. totally enjoys it. He just has so much duality where he has that heartlessness in him, that yeah. carelessness. But at the same time, he expects others to kind of like have the emotions he doesn't exhibit or can indulge in knowing that they also have the blackness in their heart that he does or exhibits yeah. so freely. And then he, at the same time, has a very big heart. I love the whole motif of seeing the, the Silk Spectre uh, everywhere in his house and in his belongings yeah. because he always loved her. And had a thing for her. But he also tried to rape her and was creepy about it. Yeah. But, like, they loved each other at some point, right? And they res- they totally respect each other. Yeah. When the Silk Spectre... Uh, sidetrack. When the Silk Spectre says, like, when you get older, the future seems darker and darker. But as you keep going, the past 
starts to get brighter and brighter, even the dark stuff, even the murky stuff. Yeah. And that was like the first time I ever heard anything like that. I was like, whoa, that's powerful. And of course, that's being, you know, put up against a rape scene. But yeah, I guess I think that also makes it all that more memorable for it because it has that huge contrast of, yeah, this lady is getting raped. But at the same time, it's an interesting take on that incident. And then also later when it's revealed that like, I'm just going to spoil this whole fucking movie without reservation. Can I? Yeah. I mean, I already spoiled the ending, so. Yeah. Silk Spectre, the second Lori Jupiter is, uh, the comedian's daughter. So it's really funny. The comedian's whole outlook, I think is so beautiful. It's not quite anarchy, but it's totally revelatory and like all the ugliness. Yeah. He, Dr. Manhattan and Rorschach are just so strong. They play with each other so well because their characters are just so well defined. Jeffrey Dean Morgan just looks like a bootleg uh, Robert Downey Jr. I was going to say, when I first saw the preview for this movie, I thought that that was Robert Downey Jr. Yeah, his character is very much like a very cynical uh, (laughs) Iron Man. A brutally downtrodden Robert Downey Jr. And then uh, Rorschach is like a really cynical brutal batman right right and then dr manhattan is just superman but like if he were to just not Jaded. be like oh yeah 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 like if he could just be like <laughs> Jaded superman. nothing matters <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's beautiful like you see the personality disorders that they would actually have to come to grips with to be their character yeah. yeah exactly the only ones that they're are like, like super, they're all deeply damaged people yeah, you also see that a little bit with Lori Jupiter, the Silk Spectre the Second, where she's raised to be a Cape Crusader, and like the personality, not the personality, the she has to grapple with her own past of like, oh my god, I had a fucked up mom in a family. Yeah. I had, a, I was kind of pushed into being a superhero. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's not like the whole Robin who's like, oh, I love going on adventures, Batman. It's like, <laughs> oh no, I got issues. You know? Yeah. It's pretty great. Uh, I think I'll just quote Rorschach and I'll move on from the characters after this this sums it up pretty good I think between the comedian and Rorschach ahem <laughs> Edward Blake the comedian born 1918 buried in the rain murdered is that what happens to us no time for friends only our enemies leave roses violent lives ending violently you know I, I really I like oh wait there's a little bit more I'll um, I'll give you an encore. How's that? Blake understood. <laughs> Blake understood. Humans are savage in nature. No matter how much you try to dress it up to disguise it, Blake saw society's true face. Chose to be a parody of it. A joke. So that was gonna bring me into Moloch, where when you see these kind of dual personalities of these characters, Moloch the supervillain brings roses to Edward Blake for his funeral. And Rorschach's like, what the fuck were you doing here? Were you responsible for his death? He's like, no, I just thought I had to pay my respects. And then when Rorschach's trying to like, you clean and like pulls open the pills, amygdalin, you know, like this is like some bootleg shit. Can't be taking this. And then Moloch pleads with him. Like, you know, I, I got, I got cancer, you know, I need this. I'm trying anything. And it's so sad, right? You don't know whether or not what, Rorschach chooses to do at that scene, which I love the open for interpretation part because we don't yeah. see him take it away, we don't see it giving it to him, we just see him walk away, like outside of the house or outside of the apartment, because Rorschach too has his own. Um, he's he's black and white, but at the same time he's not completely cold either. You know what I mean? Because yeah. he's he has his soft spots. Yeah, it's so funny. Even the way he um reminisces about the death of Edward Blake, violent lives ending violently. You know what I mean? There's a certain warmth or nostalgia in that. At the same time, a very sad realization. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's it's really cool. God, these these characters are just so brilliantly written. Yeah. I wanted to point this out. One of my favorite. Uh, you know, The Simpsons has really funny storefront names sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Like Hammock Shack or something. Like just random <laughs> yeah. shit. I love Gunga Diner in this movie. Like Gunga Din, but it's Gunga Diner. Yeah. Wow. It's a famous poem. I didn't even notice that. It's on the blimp in the very beginning. You see see it a while. Like, there's a purple elephant in a lot of different shots called for Gunga Diner. And um, 
when they're eating in the uh, diner, there's a scene where Night Owl and the Silk Spectre are in the diner. They go out and it's the Gunga Diner. And I'm like, yay, the Gunga Diner. If you guys haven't read that poem, read it. It's really good. Damn, that's crazy. I like that. Yeah, I never noticed that. Yeah, the poem, I think, uh, has a little bit to do with the the movie or the comic book. Also, the Ozymandias reference. His name is Ozymandias. And that's also a poem where... Look all on my works, ye, whatever, kings and despair. Because Ozymandias was the king of kings and he had this like great empire. But apparently it was like, you know, in the future when archaeologists are looking at it, it's nothing but dust and ruin. So it's like, yeah. it's ironic to read that. And so the, the hero slash villain Ozymandias, I am completely spoiling it now, is named Ozymandias. And it's really great. I love these little inserts, these little uh, yeah. literary things. Love the color use. I love all the shot choice. I love most of the shot choices, rather. The fights are fun and kung fu y. They feel like an yeah. Arkham game. I don't know if you've ever played any of the Arkham Batman games. Yeah, where they're super brutal. Yeah, and like they're really fluid and like big hits, kind of like knock yeah. people out. Pretty fun. I like that semi post apocalyptic world. It kind of flirts with like a Blade Runner esque kind of future where like. Japanese culture is very intertwined with the future. Yeah, yeah. That so was the funny. gangs are like the top, knots. the top knots. They like wear Japanese <laughs> shit and have Japanese top knots. It's just really funny. Oh man, I don't know. I think this is my favorite DC movie by far, and the music also is fantastic in this movie. I think this oh, is yeah. an excellent soundtrack. And this, this is what effect. fucking uh, Suicide Squad tried to do. This yeah, one, I tried to rip it off. This one did it right. This one did it yeah. right. I tried to rip it off Slash. It tried to rip off uh, Space Guys. What is it called? Galaxy Space Guys. Cowboys. Yeah, Galaxy the Galaxy Quest. Guys. You know. <laughs> you know what I'm talking yeah, about, right? Yeah, the Galaxy Guys. Yeah, with, the, no, with Rocky no Raccoon. Clue. With Rocky Raccoon and Groot the Galaxy Guys. Oh, fucking guys. Uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah, the Galaxy Guys. <laughs> Shit. The Galaxy Guys. That's yeah. Right. I'm just oozing at this point. Uh, let's move on to what we didn't like. Paul, what didn't work for you in the Watch Bid? Um, so for all my talk of the acting being, um, high quality, there occasionally would be a scene where I was like, huh, why did they do that like this? I'm not sure that acting works for me in this scene. I have a few of those too. Yeah. One of them is the, uh, when the original Silk Spectre is in her regular house clothes and she's like, I was a hero. God damn it. Yeah. And she like shakes really weirdly and like. I don't know. I I mean, like, I've heard people arguing pretty passionately. I've never seen anything exactly like that. It felt like, felt weird to me. Um, mm-hmm. Didn't, so I know this is part of the movie and uh, part of the plot. The characters kind of need this. I didn't need the uh, hallelujah sex scene. Yeah, that's always why. another thing I don't like. It was uh, it was fine. I didn't think it was a bad scene. I didn't think it was badly done. It was very tasteful. Wait, which version uh, of yours? I just didn't need it. Which version of yours did you see? Did you see the director's cut, the original? or the... I watched the director's cut, yeah. Okay, I think I watched the director's cut and the super one. I'm not sure if the super one sex scene was longer. Okay. But, my God, does that go on? You see some, like, almost penetration in that sex scene. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> uh yeah, not a bad scene, not badly done. Just I didn't didn't need it. I know that these guys need to bone to, you know, get going, but uh I don't know. Didn't need No, it that felt scene. really weird to me too. Yeah. Uh I I'll also say um I would have liked to have had more of the dialogue and less of the fighting in the last scene with uh Ozymandias uh in it. Oh, man, there's some really cool stuff at the end of the comic, if yeah. I recall correctly. It's been a while. Um, but other than that, I don't think there was a lot that I disliked or that didn't really work for me. Uh, I think this is a mostly uh, workable, well-done movie. Cool. Yeah. What about you? What What didn't work for you in this one? There's a lot of acting choices in this movie that I think they needed a second take on, or I don't know why they went with that take particularly. Yeah. The Night Owl... I thought he was a really bad actor. Not a really bad season. He was passable, but like, God, man, there were a couple scenes where it was like, all right, take two. I think it needed. When like the Silk Spectre, the second, is like, sorry, you know, I came out to have some laughs, but it seems like laughs are in short supply these days. And he's like, 
what do you expect? The comedian is dead. Take two. Yeah. You know, do that again. I always thought, though, that his acting performance was supposed to portray him as kind of like a square. I don't know if that resonates with you at all. Oh, I can see that. But it doesn't come off realistic. Because when you say that, like, these are dudes who, like, are, like, old war buddies. They're, like, you know, they're all out of a job, but they're still, like, kind of work friends. Yeah. His performance just really kind of pales. Doesn't do it for you. Yeah, there are scenes where he's good and that square just comes off properly, where he's like showing Silk Spectre the goggles and then he's like, yeah, isn't it cool? It's great. And then she's like, wow, this must be what it's like for John to see. John being uh, Dr. Manhattan. Yeah. Then he gets all uncomfortable. He's like, uh, yeah, why don't you put those away when you're done? I better get the food. Like, that worked fine. And that was him being a square. That was well acted. The reaction was fine. It was, you know. But there are moments, a lot of moments... Her, the Silk Spectre the second, and um, Night Owl's acting, I think, just really weren't up to par with the rest of the movie. Huh. Thank God Dr. Manhattan, the comedian, and Rorschach are so strong, because if their acting was more like those two, I would have had a huge problem. Like, I had, a, I took a huge issue with that this time watching it. The first time I did, too. And then the second time I watched it, I think I, I was able to, like, put that out of my brain and just be completely... So here's the thing. First time I watched the uh, Watchmen, for some reason I didn't like it very much. Second time I watched it, probably the director's cut. I loved it a lot. Third time yeah. I watched it, well, I've watched it so many times since then. But then watching it for the podcast, I hated their acting so much it bothered me. It bothered me, and I wasn't sure that like I didn't like it not nearly as much as I remember liking it. Sure. And I don't know if I became more picky to the acting or if that's just something I remember me not liking in the very beginning. I don't know. Yeah, I mean the acting is heavily stylized, like. Even the regular people in the world are very kind of out there, you know, so I don't blame you for that. Regular people? Yeah, yeah. like the people who are like background actors who like have one line or whatever. Like those are all real extreme, sty- like extremely stylized as well. They're not. I don't know if I would call it most of it stylized. I think half of it is bad. The Vietnamese hmm. lady, I thought she was a terrible actress. Hmm. I think the cops were kind of bad. I think bootleg Neil deGrasse Tyson was like, all right. Sure. I like the midget. The midget was good. But no, like, there weren't too many regular people that I was, like, cool with. Hmm. I can't think of any of them. They didn't really have a prominent role if they did. Anyway, the reporters were good. Oh, yeah. The guy who was like, he's a reporter a couple times. He's good. CIA agents are all right. They're passable. But no, I think because this movie tried very heavily not to have brand names, I think... Because by its cast alone, it looks like it should be a B-movie because you don't know a lot of these dudes at the time. Yeah. And then a lot of those actors do seem like B-movie actors because their performances don't come off very good. It's just amazing that this still comes off as that good of a movie with, in my opinion, that anchor on it. A couple weak performances and some some shit they should have left on the cutting room floor in terms of their performances. Sure. Sex scene also bothered me. It was so long. You got the point across right away. I think that was like... (laughs) Yeah. If the point was to make you uncomfortable by the end of it and just wanting you to have that be done with, I guess kudos. But the whole thing just came off as like really weird. It was corny with the music choice. Hallelujah with Barry White. The entirety of the song, they're fucking. That's a long fuck, man. (laughs) Not in terms of real life, but I mean like for the movie. Like, And we're seeing like... Like I said, near penetration in a lot of cases. That's like a three-minute song, too. Yeah. We're just watching them go at it. And it's like, okay. All right. Cut to Rorschach now. Uh, cut to Rorschach now. Oh, my God. Are they going <laughs> to cut to Rorschach now? And then the end of the song, finally, they cut to Rorschach now. It's like, what the fuck? Yeah, anyway. Right. I like the ending of this movie much better than the comic. Can I spoil the ending of the comic for you? Are you okay with that? Yeah. I know there's some sort of squid... Correct. So Ozymandias is getting a bunch of uh, different engineers, genetic engineers and all that sort of thing. And like, as well as like, you know, Dr. Manhattan technology people to create different shit. I don't know what they're doing. It's like, it's like some weird project of his, but the technologies kind of converge. This is its own story arc, right? Where you follow a couple scientists in paradise because Ozymandias is putting everything up while they complete their work. So he has like really famous artists and painters and shit working on designing him this 
genetic abomination, as well as the scientist putting together his teleportation energy crisis thing, right? Sure. As you know, by the end of this movie, they get killed because the yeah. reward for the servants of the pharaohs was death, hardly a reward at all kind of thing. And so they have to die. Ozymandias teleports these giant squid abominations into the capitals of the world or whatever to make it look like an alien attack. And there is that initial like explosion of like people dying. Some people go crazy and everything. There's some like atomic bomb imagery in the comics too, where like people's like ashes, their like incinerated silhouette is like stuck onto walls, and that's the only thing sure. left of them. You know what I mean? They have yeah. that in the comic book, which is really cool. But the enemy is not Doctor Manhattan. The enemy is a squid, or giant squids from space that hmm. the governments of the world have to unite against, thinking that we're under attack by aliens. We have to unite and make sure that there aren't any aliens gonna come fuck with us. When it was really Ozymandias, right? Sure. The ending in this, like the ending in um, Fight Club, I think are way more appropriate. It lends itself better to the story. It's more believable. And fighting Dr. Manhattan is so much more grounded. Thinking that Dr. Manhattan is like the ultimate evil. Yeah. Turns himself into like, you know, a judger, if you will, because he already is a godlike status. Mm -hmm. For him to also be a judge and jury is not that far-fetched. So I like that ending far better in the movie. And... I think that's about it. Oh, oh, I saw two different versions. So I saw the director's cut and the unlimited version or whatever it's called. The unlimited version sucked. It had so much extra shit and there was way more bad acting in the ultra shit. Like the newspaper guy was a bad actor. Sure. There's way too many scenes with him. Yeah. The kid is reading a comic. The story of the comic is really, really delightful. It's like done like in an anime style, mm-hmm. but it's about like the guy at sea, the Mariner or something. Not really the Mariner story, but like it's a really cool story. And I really liked how that was cut with the movie, but wholly unnecessary. Totally unnecessary. Does it take away from it? You could argue. Yeah, it does. Sure. But I actually really liked it. I wouldn't want it in the cut I would prefer, but it was cool seeing it. The ultimate one is way too long. It's three and a half hours. It's Lawrence of Arabia, motherfucking. Oh, gosh. Way man, too long. On. No intermission. Anyway. That's too much. Yeah. Those are uh, those are the things that I particularly didn't like. Sure. Is there anything else that you wanted to cover before uh, we move on to recommendations? We've already gone pretty long, but I had initially wanted to talk about the uh, philosophies of each of the characters, um, but I think we've we've gone long enough. Uh, maybe that's something we can revisit for another time, because it's kind of a fun topic to talk about. I would like to do that, too. Yeah, maybe we could find some common resources and read them together and discuss and shit. The Watchmen very well could have been its own episode, because yeah. I would have liked to have digged into the themes, too, and like... Where I kept bringing up socio-political atmosphere, I wanted to bring up the or talk also too about I guess just dig into more of that. I guess like I said, the philosophy of the characters. I like yeah Manhattan's Buddhist thing going on there. Everything. Perhaps we should revisit this. Maybe like we did in that one episode with uh, Apocalypse Now, a part two, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. I think that might be a fun thing to do. Sure. So. For recommendations. Paul, would you recommend The Watchmen? Uh, I would. I would say it's uh, philosophically and morally a a high ground above the current uh, swath of superhero movies we have going on right now. Um, It's cinematically beautiful, and um, the plot is really intricate, so much so that you oftentimes need to watch it a couple of times to get, get it. Um, yeah, every time I recommend this one. What about you? Would you recommend this one? I also would recommend this movie. I think this is a very high point of superhero movies, as well as a superhero, the genre, comics, idea wise, everything. This exemplifies so much of what the genre can bring to the table. Or what that idea can bring in terms of just self-reflection, reflection reflection of, you know, the place in which you live, and religion, all sorts of things. Technology. I think I also wanted to watch The Watchmen recently because we got a lot of um, shit going on now where, you know, cops are getting a lot of bad press lately for good reason, obviously. The NFL thing is happening and then, you know for some reason is dividing people. I don't understand how this is even divisive, but I was like, you know, it'd be a fun one to kind of revisit the Watchmen because who watches the Watchmen, you know? Right. And I feel like that's a very prevalent topic in today's 
American climate, if you will. I guess all over the world, even when you think yeah. about you know what's happening in China and Russia, a little bit in Britain, but not as much. I don't think. You know what I mean? Like, I just think that's a really cool idea to explore who watches the Watchmen when the Watchmen are superheroes and they're saying badges, not masks. And it's like, yeah, then you get badges. And then it's like, oh, <laughs> what do you got? And who watches those Watchmen? Yeah, who watches, who badges the Badgers? So. <laughs> <laughs> who badges the Badgers? Yeah. It was fun to come back to it for all the different reasons. It's um, so intellectually stimulating. It's a movie that keeps on giving. And I would definitely oh, yeah. give this a uh, thumbs up. If you don't like it, I say give it another watch in a in a little while. You might come back around to it, like I did. Yeah. So. Yeah, different things pop out each time. Yeah, a hundred percent recommendation here. Yeah, because you expect what you remember, and you don't expect what you don't remember. Mm-hmm. Oh shit. Though. That's not very Manhattan of you. No, I'm just saying that about the movie. When you watch it the second time, you expect the things that you remember. But you're not experiencing your future experience with your past experience, with your present experience. I mean, <laughs> get the Time fuck out of here, Time is a flat circle. Time is a flat circle. Learn to right. fucking read, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so, until uh, next time, uh, your boy has been Paul. And it's your boy, Ancy Chan, coming at you live, not really because this is recorded. And we will see you guys next time. Bye. Bye. Who is he the awkward bye? (laughs) Then we take Berlin.